So we're going to finish up Hamlet in a few minutes and then start the um, section on poetry. I'm trying to remember. I know we're in the very last scene, but I can't remember if we're on page 1330 or 1332, because I moved my note. Um, had they already started the fencing match? Yeah, they, they, we, we heard them dying. Okay, people have been dying. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Um, so, if I remember correctly, then we are towards the bottom of 1332. The queen has already fallen. And Laertes said that, you know, he's a woodcock to his own spring. Ostrich, I am justly killed with mine own treachery. Okay? Hamlet asks how the queen is. The king says, oh, she just fainted because, you know, she saw blood. And Laertes says, uh, the queen says, no, the drink, the drink, I am poisoned. Hamlet, oh, villainy, ho, let the door be locked. Treachery, seek it out. And that's when Laertes collapses. And Laertes says, it is here, Hamlet. That is, Hamlet says, treachery, seek it out. And Laertes says, treachery is right here, Hamlet. It's me. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good, and thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. Hamlet knows he's been stabbed. He knows, you know, Laertes' foil had the tip removed. And now Laertes tells him, and the tip is poisoned. Lo, here, I, excuse me, the foul practice hath turned itself on me. It's like the third or fourth time we've had this idea of someone's plot or someone's plotting against somebody else being turned upon the plotter, the being hoist with one's own petard in other sense, or in other words. Here I lie never to rise again. I'm stabbed too, Hamlet, I'm about to die. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. That is, I can't do anything else. The king, the king's to blame. So Hamlet hears, your mother's been poisoned, the king's to blame, Hamlet has the foil in his hand, and he says, in the point in venom too, and he stabs the king. Then venom to thy work. And everybody else yells, Treason, treason. Why? Are they saying treason, treason because the king is treasonous to Hamlet? No. Because Hamlet's just killed the king. Okay? Oh, yet defend me, friends, I am but hurt. The king is saying, I'm not dead yet. Okay? Hamlet, hear thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane. Drink off this potion. Is thy union, that is the thing you put in that the king referred to earlier, is thy union here? Follow my mother. In Hamlet slash Shakespeare, puns on that meaning of word union. The union between Claudius and Hamlet's mother. Let it, Hamlet is implying, let it die also. Okay? So, the king said, I'm not mortally wounded, I'm just wounded. Hamlet takes the poison in the cup now, forces his mouth open and forces him to drink it. In other words, you're gonna die no matter what. Follow my mother, Laertes. He is justly served. Got his just desserts. It is a poison tempered by himself. That is the poison in the cup. So, the king, as with Laertes, hoist by his own petard. Okay. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Why does he ask for forgiveness? Why does he say exchange forgiveness with me? Remember, this is Shakespeare's most religious, most Christian of plays, wrestling with Catholic and Christian doctrine slash ideology, if you want. 
what is a central tenet? T E N E T. Almost all the time, when you see that word in the press, in the media, they say tenant. A tenant is a person who rents a room or a building. A tenant is a central belief of something or doctrine or plank position of something. So what is a central tenet of Christianity? From Jesus' mouth himself. If you want to be forgiven, what do you have to do? For, you have to forgive others. Okay. Yes, repent, obviously. But you have to forgive others. Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, then my Father won't forgive you. If you do forgive others, then he will forgive you. Peter asked, you know, come on, man. Jesus, how many times do you have to forgive somebody? I mean, seven times? Seven times seven. Actually, he says 70 times seven. In other words, every time, okay? And it's there in the heart of, you know, the quote-unquote Christian prayer, the Lord's Prayer that he gave to his disciples. Forgive us our trespasses, our debts, our sins. What's the next half? Lead us not into temptation. Before that? As we forgive others. As we forgive others. Forgive us. How? As we forgive others. So if we don't forgive others, we don't get forgiven. Why does Hamlet Sr. spend his days in sulfurous flames? How did he die? Unforgiven. He did not receive last rites. That's what the priest does in last rites. Ideally, last rites, the person is still breathing so that the person can say, do you repent? Yes. <coughs> You know, and then dies, kind of a thing. That's enough within the eyes of, you know, the church, so to speak, okay? So, he says, exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet, mine and my father's death come not upon thee. What is Laertes saying? Don't let my death be on your head. Who's he saying that to? Okay, it's literally it's to Hamlet. What else is it though? God, don't blame Hamlet for my death. God, don't blame Hamlet for Polonius' death. He's just forgiven him for his father's death. Okay? Nor thine, nor if you agree to forgive me, nor will your death be on my head. Hamlet. Heaven make thee free of it. In other words, I put this eraser, eraser wiped clean. That's what Hamlet means. Done. Forgiven. I follow thee. That is, I'm right behind you, Laertes. Actually, if anything, Hamlet's going to be ahead of Laertes, right? He got stabbed first. <coughs> so, I am dead, Horatio. He's not obviously literally dead because he's still going to keep speaking for a few minutes. Wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance that are but mutes or audience to this act, had I but time? Who's he speaking to? Everybody else in this room. Okay? You that look pale, they're in shock at this. And they tremble. He says, you're but mutes. They can't. They're so surprised, their tongues are tied. Had I but time, uh, uh, but he feels the poison working. As this fell sergeant, death is strict in his arrest. Oh, I could tell you. He could tell them what? His whole story, right? He would go back to the beginning. 
I saw a ghost. The ghost was my father. The ghost of my father told me that Claudius poisoned him when he was sleeping in his orchard. And he could go on and lay out all the plotting, all the stuff. Polonius is spying. Claudius is spying. Ophelia is being used. Ophelia is being turned against him. Rosencrantz, everything. But let it be. He doesn't have time. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Who does he mean by the unsatisfied? If you're unsatisfied, what do you lack? Fulfillment. Fulfillment? Satisfaction. What's meant by satisfaction? Happiness. Happiness. Go back for a second. If you're unsatisfied, you're unfulfilled, something's missing, right? The unsatisfied are those who don't know the answers. Who doesn't know the answers to what has happened? Everyone but Horatio. Did Hamlet tell Marcellus and Bernardo about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Nope. Did he tell them about the king? Nope. Who's the only, he only told Horatio, okay? Horatio, no, forget it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Here's yet some liquor left. And he grabs the cup and he gets ready to drink. What does he mean? I'm more an antique Roman than a Dane. He likes wine. Yeah, partially. Wrote, uh, Horatio's philosophy, he's a Stoic. Stoics didn't believe in anything after death. This is all there is, okay? But more importantly than that, he is saying, I'm more like an antique Roman lieutenant with his general, or colonel with his general, if you want. In other words, the second hand, the right-hand man to a leader, Roman fashion in good Roman fashion, if your leader died in battle and it looks like you are going to be captured, you don't get captured. You commit suicide. You die with your Lord. Okay? That's what he's saying. No, 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 no. I, I'm not going to get captured. I'm, I'm dying with you, Hamlet. And Hamlet says... As art of man, give me the cup. And he takes the cup from him and drinks it all. Why? Horatio, what a wounded name, thinks standing thus unknown shall live behind me. What's he mean? If you die and I die, what will people think of Hamlet? The people out there, they'll think Hamlet killed the king. Will there be anyone to say against that? No, there won't. They'll think the quote unquote official version is true. Everybody who's been in this audience, who has seen everything happen, they'll go out and say, Hamlet and Laertes fought and Hamlet killed the king. And they'll kind of suggest other things. Okay? So he goes on. He says, I will have a wounded name. He wants his name to be what after he dies? Good. Good. Right? How many of you want when you die, whether that, God forbid, today, tomorrow, hopefully 60 years from now, how many of you want people to go to your funeral and hear, you know, Ashton Penn, she was such a wretched person. Just stomped on people all her life. And, you know, she got what she had coming. Nobody wants that. You want a, what do you want to hear at your funeral? What's a eulogy? Somebody got in and rebuilt home. 
Literally, good word. It's the good word spoken about you. You don't want somebody to stand up and deliver a dislogy where they diss you on your death, okay? Hamlet says, if you die, I'm going to have a dislogy for the rest of forever. So, <clears throat> if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while. That is a Long phrase that means what? Don't die yet. What's felicity? Heaven. Or maybe because of Horatio's stoic attitude, it's just the lack of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune of this life. How did Oedipus the king end? Count no mortal happy till he has passed the final limit of his life, secure from pain. In the other translation that is used in the 10th edition, it says... Count no man happy until he is dead at last, free from pain. In other words, life here means what? Pain. Okay? So, absent thee from felicity, lack of pain, a while. And in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain. If you live, you're going to suffer, right? And Hamlet gives them a reason to do that. To tell my story. Tell the story of Hamlet. I know it means you're going to have to suffer. Why? Because you're going to be alive still. And that means suffering. Okay? He hears a noise. Ostrich says, it's young Fortinbras. With conquest from Poland. Oh, great. He won that little crappy piece of land. Okay? That he hazarded 20,000 men's lives for. To the ambassadors of England gives this warlike volley. So, Fortune Bra enters. The ambassadors from England, who have come to England to tell King Claudius what? I've done what you commanded. I killed Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Because Hamlet switched the letters, okay? Hamlet, I die, Horatio. It's like the third time now that he said it. And he says, I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbra. He has my dying voice. What election? Oh, the running of the king? To be king of Denmark. Okay? Mentioned this before. Germanic custom... You had electors. The electors represented the states, counties, however you want to call it, the areas of Denmark, or you know, in the broader sense, um, in Germany itself. In Germany, you had the electorates. It's where the founding fathers got the idea of the electoral college. Okay, and what the electors would do, the vast majority of times is they would elect, when a king died, they would elect the king's eldest son to be king. Law of primogenitor, right? It was pretty much just a rubber stamp. Who is aligned to be king after Hamlet? No one. Hamlet died without heir. Claudius died without heir. There's no... Little Hamlet off in the wings, waiting, okay? So Hamlet says, somebody's got to be chosen to be the new king. I think it's going to be Fortinbras, and he has my dying vote. Is that important? Hamlet 
Has King Charles been crowned King of England yet? No, he hasn't. When did he become king? Literally, the second a medical examiner declared Queen Elizabeth II, long live the king, the queen, was dead. The second she died, he became king. He's not been crowned. It's not going to be till next year. Why? Because it's going to be the biggest thing you've ever seen in England. I mean, they're going to go all out because there hasn't been a king for over 70 years. Okay? It's been a queen, but not a king. I'm not saying one's better than the other. So, Horatio says, now cracks a noble heart. I think that's ambiguous. Hamlet's heart has cracked. He died. And I think Horatio is saying his heart is cracking through sorrow. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest, etc. Fortinbrock comes in. He's like, what the hell is going on here? Why? How many people are dead? King, Queen, Laertes, Hamlet. Those are the ones we see. How many people have died? Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern. Can't do that because my fingers. Hamlet Sr. Okay. A lot of people have died in the last two months, four months, whatever it is. Okay. So Horatio says he orders the bodies to be placed in such a way. And he says, and I'll tell the unknowing world, and we'll stop with this, line 350. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world. That is, the world is ignorant about everything that has occurred. How these things came about. So shall you hear. And here's what the world is going to hear. Of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts. Carnal, having to do with the body. And yes, it has the carnal sex idea. Bloody and unnatural acts. Like killing a brother. That's carnal. It's bloody and it's unnatural. Marrying the brother's sister. Carnal, bloody, and unnatural. It's incestuous. Okay. Of accidental judgments, casual slaughters. What? Give me an example of an accidental judgment. <clears throat> Is it the king? When Hamlet kills Polonius. Casual slaughter? Yeah, that's pretty casual. But what was even more casual than that? When Hamlet replaces the letter instructing for him to be killed with a letter to the king of England instructing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. It's, Hamlet told us, <laughs> my conscience is clear. They're getting what they have coming. They made love to do this, essentially, he says. Okay? What else? Of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause. Well, whose deaths were put on by cunning, meaning plotting and forced cause? Laertes, accidentally. Hamlet's, yes, definitely. And in this upshot... And he leaves the best for last. Because in one sense, the whole play. Should I make this assertion? Yeah. In one sense, the whole play is about this final point. Purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. Purposes, plots, contrivances, mistook. That is not going according to plan. Did what? They fell upon the plotter's heads. Hamlet's line about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. About being hoist with their own petard. It seems like Shakespeare is giving a warning to people. Don't create these big plots and conspiracies because what may very well happen 
you might get caught up in your own actions. Okay? I mean, wood, you know, springs to catch woodcocks, we heard that repeatedly throughout. Okay? So, we finished Hamlet. Exam was posted yesterday, due Monday evening, I believe, for drama. It covers all the stuff for drama, everything from talking about Sophocles and Greek drama up through everything they've said about Shakespeare and all the introductory material about Shakespeare, okay? Um, now go to, wrong pages. Reading poetry, writing about poetry, etc. Wrong syllabus in front of me again. There it is. Uh, 589, 5 to 626, etc. We won't get very far in this section today. So, for Friday, um, if you haven't already read it, read all the stuff about the introduction of poetry, you know, the Word, word choice, word order, tone, blah, 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 through combining the elements of poetry, okay? And, and the two poems I told my first class something wrong. The two poems that are on the syllabus for October 28th, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time and To His Coy Mistress. Okay. Yeah, in the 11th edition, 589. In the other edition, 10th edition, 755. Okay. So 589. I just wanted one thing. The most important thing, probably, that your editor, Michael Meyer, writes about all the poetry stuff is the first sentence. Perhaps the best way to begin reading poetry responsibly is to not allow yourself to be intimidated by it. I know the answer to this question because it's always the same, but I'll ask it anyways. How many of you read poetry every day? That's what I thought. How many of you listen to poetry like every day? You all do. Every one of you, unless you don't listen to songs, Maybe you don't, maybe you're weird and you listen to Audible and books being read or something all day long. Um, if you listen to any songs that is music with words, okay, you're listening to poetry. It might be good poetry, it might be bad poetry. I'm sure probably from my perspective, a lot of it's bad poetry. But if you listen to whatever kinds of songs, okay, you're hearing poetry. Rap, hip hop, rock, R&B, reg, doesn't matter. It's all poetry, okay? So what's a poem? Literally, we would have to say a poem is something made. <laughs> it goes back to the word poem and poetry come from the old Greek, ancient Greek, poesis. And all poesis means is to make. So a poem is something made. This, in that sense, okay, big, huge qualifier there, in that sense, this is a poem. This is a poem, this is a poem, and all the poems we read in the book are poems, okay? So why did I say in this sense or in that sense? Because literature has what are called conventions. And we talked about that when we began the semester. That is, there are certain rules that apply to different kinds of literature, right? Fiction, stories, have got to have what? Every one of them. Characters. If you don't have any characters, what are you reading about, okay? Um, they have to have conflict. That's the number one thing, okay? Poems 
are made out of words and such, okay? Rhyming sometimes, not rhyming other times, etc., etc. All right? So one of the conventions of poetry, or some of the conventions of poetry, is that you have what's called, those are E's, meter. A line of poetry is made up of accented and unaccented syllables. And how those syllables are accented and unaccented give us a whole bunch, a whole bunch of different kinds, or a whole bunch of different kinds, man, of meter. We're not going to go into meter very much. Other professors who teach us go into all these different kinds of Greek meters and Roman meters, and I don't pay any attention to that. Why? Because it doesn't necessarily make poetry more accessible to you. If anything, it does the exact opposite. What else? Poems often rhyme. We will talk a little bit about rhyme scheme, different patterns of rhyming. Rhyming within a line of poetry, what's called internal rhyme, and rhyming at the ends of lines of poetry. And things like I rhyme, where two words look like they should rhyme, like those, <laughs> but notice none of those rhyme. Bow, though, enough, okay? But those could be used as an I rhyme. They look the same, but they're not quite, etc. So, don't be intimidated. Because most people, when they hear poem, poetry, they think, I don't like poetry, I don't understand poetry, I don't do poetry, I don't write poetry, etc. And it's a very, create a mental block. But if you think of it as songs you listen to on your earbuds, etc., it'll make it more accessible. The other thing is, the second paragraph, first line and second line, whatever the poem is you're reading, read it aloud. Why? Poems, for the, the majority of human history, poems were composed to be heard. They weren't composed just to be read. So there's a sound quality that you should hear, okay? You may not get the pronunciation right. You may not understand how you're supposed to pause and not pause, etc. You just read it through. So, turn to page 591 and let's look at this poem, Those Winter Sundays. All right. Now, for the final exam, which will just be over the section on poetry, it won't cover anything else except for extra credit, could show up in there. Everything we do from today forward can show up on quizzes and the exam. So, for example, we're going to spend, <laughs> I ended up almost a half an hour talking about this poem. I'm not going to spend that long in here. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes. 10 or 15 at least, talking about this poem, Those Winter Sundays. Those Winter Sundays, this poem, can show up on a quiz and it can show up on the final exam, okay? A lot of the times we'll do that as we're going through these sections, we're gonna go over a poem that's already on the syllabus so that when we get to that poem a little bit later on, we probably won't say much about it. I'm wondering if the alarm's gonna go off soon. Um, so, those winter Sundays, notice the title. Titles give us a roadmap. Titles give us a direction that we're going. So, what's the title mean? Always ask yourself, once you see a title, some poems won't have titles. Once you see the title, where are you going? What's it mean? What, what's the poem somehow about? Okay, cold, baby. You're going a little deeper. Just look at the surface. 
winter Sundays. That's it. So Sundays from like, I don't know, 1st of December to what, end of February, something like that. Okay. But it's those winter Sundays. It's not just winter Sundays, it's specifying. Okay. <coughs> now, another thing about when you read poetry, you really have to pay attention to marks of punctuation. Poems are often not punctuated grammatically. You know, when you write and you write a paper or you write a letter or you write something for somebody else, unless you're texting, doesn't count. Um, you've been trained, you've been taught, you've been indoctrinated, you've been brainwashed to punctuate grammatically. What do I mean by that? What does this mean? Grammatically. Why do you use a period? When do you use a period? You come to the end of a sentence and there's a break. Okay? And a sentence is a complete whole idea. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. But a sentence contains a complete whole idea. What about a comma? You're separating two clauses, right? Can those two clauses be... I went to the store, comma, I bought some milk, period. Is there a problem with that sentence? Because it is one sentence. It ends with the period at the end. Is that sentence grammatically correct? No, it's not. Why? You shook your head. Why isn't it grammatically correct? It's a conjunction. It needs a conjunction. Con, co, with, junction, joining together. Why does it need a conjunction? Because this is an independent clause. It's a separate whole idea. And this is an independent clause. It's a separate whole idea. Okay? You're joining together with a comma, and this is called, if this were a writing class, a comma splice. You're joining together, splicing, two independent clauses with just a comma. You can't do that. So you would have to say, I went to the store, comma, and I bought some milk. Okay. Or you could replace the comma with a semicolon, right? That's grammatical. That's a mark of punctuation being used grammatically. Notice I wrote this part of the sentence down here. What if I had done this? I went to the store, comma, I bought some milk. And then I had something else down here that rhymed with this, period. Indicating this is a poem. If you like your poetry, you don't have to be grammatically correct. Why? Because poetry is more oral, ear, and oratory. It's meant to be said aloud and heard. Okay? So, in poetry, when you see a comma, Often, the majority of time, what the comma is, let me back up. The origins of punctuation goes back to about 400 BC, all right? Began by Greek writers and, and grammarians, what are called grammarians. They introduced marks of punctuation for one purpose, and that was for the oratorical delivery of material. It wasn't originally for poetry. It was for prose, for speeches. Okay? A comma was indicated to indicate a pause. That's it. Just a pause. 
Why would you need a pause while speaking? To breathe. So you can take a breath and go on again. Okay? So a comma indicates a short breathing pause. What about a period? That's a longer breathing pause. That's take a second, get a sip. Now go on. A semicolon. A semicolon is between a comma and a period in terms of the length of the pause. And a colon is essentially the exact same as a semicolon. Colon and semicolon, the real difference, that's grammatical. Okay? You use a semicolon, excuse me, you use a colon to usually do what? To totally rephrase something that was on the, on the left side of the colon, okay? Or to indicate a series of things. For Republicans, the election last night was horrible. Colon. And then you go through and list, you know, all the people who lost who were supposed to have won. For Democrats, the election was great because you did put a colon and you list all the races the Democrats were who won that were they were supposed to have lost. Okay? Um, question mark. How do you indicate a question mark orally? How do you indicate a question when you're asking somebody something? What does your voice tend to do? Extend it extends and it rises. Okay. What do you mean? How did you say that kind of thing? In other words, there's a different inflection in it. Okay. So. When you read marks of punctuation in a poem, for example, this one, indicate those pauses. One other comment before we talk about the poem itself. When there's no mark of punctuation at the end of a line, you just read on without pausing. When there's no mark of punctuation at the end of a stanza, you don't pause. You go on to the very next stanza. So, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold breath. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made bank fires blaze. Longer pause. Why? Because that pause is setting us up for what comes next. No one ever thanked him. Notice it's the shortest sentence of the stanza, okay? I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking, period, long pause, plus it comes at the end of the line. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, period. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? So, you start reading a poem by doing just what I did. You read it aloud first. Read it aloud again, maybe. And then you start looking at the individual words, lines, stanzas. So let's look at the first stanza. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue, black, cold. Pause there. So stop there and just look at those two lines. Notice the first two words. Okay? The title of the poem, Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too. What's the two tell us? Louder? Possibly. If you use two after something, it indicates. Well, would that have to do when it be you get up early on every other day, including Sunday? Yeah, what's another word for two? Also. So think of a synonym. Sundays also. 
My father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue, black, cold. Okay? So every other day of the week, he also gets up early and dresses. Okay? You don't have to do much with the getting up early and getting dressed. But you do with the Sundays too and the last two words of that long clause. Blue, black, cold. How can cold be blue, black? And what is blue, black? Blue is not black, right? No, it's not. So what's meant by blue, black, cold? Okay, possibly. What else? You're close, by the way. When is blue, black, cold? Okay, it's winter time, right? When is it coldest in the day? Day meaning 24 hour period. Three in the afternoon? Three in the morning? It's colder at three in the morning than it is at three in the afternoon. The coldest time of day actually is usually ju just before sunrise. Like this time of year, it's about 4 to 5 a.m. Why? Because the heat of the day is still leaving from the ground. The sun radiates, the, the ground soaks up the heat. That heat, after the sun sets, comes away from the ground. And it takes until about 4 or 5 in the morning before it's dissipated. And it's just about then that the sun rises and starts the process heating up the ground again. The blue black cold is the time of morning before the sun has risen, but where you start to see the sky turn bluish in the east. If you look directly up ahead, it's dark. You can still see stars. If you look towards the west, it's black. So blue black. Cold. It's just hour before sunrise or so. So we're told this guy gets up every morning of the week very early, before sunrise. Then with cracked cans that ache from labor in the weekday weather may banked, fire, banked fires blaze. Okay? Cracked cans that ache from labor in the weekday weather. What's this guy do for a living? Professor? Accountant? No. Does he work in a garage? Is he a mechanic? No. Why not? Because his hands are cracked with weather from the labor in the, excuse me, are cracked from the labor in the weekday weather. He works outside in the elements. Okay. In the sun, in the rain, in the snow. So, farmer, possibly. Okay, He's a laborer. Works with his hands. And what does he do on those Sunday mornings when he gets up early? He's not, work he's not out working in the cold these days. What's he doing? He made... Banked fires blaze. What's a banked fire? How many of you have ever been to a bonfire? How many of you have ever slept over at a bonfire? If you've never done it before, get some friends, go to the beach, a beach where you can do it, have a bonfire, sleep around the fire, and in the morning, wake up and go walk through the ashes because they're going to be cold, right? Yeah. No. No. Because what happens when you build a good fire? It will burn down and there will be ashes, but what's just underneath? Coals, hot coals, embers. This is an image of a guy who early in the morning goes to the wood stove or fireplace and he disturbs that ash, okay? So that the ash settles in the glowing coals are there, that's what's left of the banked 
fire from the night before. If you've lived in a log cabin for about a year, and right after, just before my wife and I got married, and then after we got married, and in the winter, I had a wood stove, I would build that fire up. It was the only place, only way I heated the entire cabin. Build that fire up so that the wood stove would almost literally be glowing red. I mean, it was no longer the black of the stove. Because by the time eight hours would go by in the morning, the fire would be dead, but there would be the coals. So what's the father do? Those winter Sunday mornings, he builds that fire back up. For what purpose? Heat the house. And then what are we told? No one ever thanked him. Why build to that last half line? What are, what are we being told about the family? However large the family is, we have no idea. Why does he do this? Because he loves his family. Louder? Because he loves his family. Okay? Second stanza. So what does no one ever think to mean? I mean? Literally. Every time you read a poem, think first of the literal meaning. It means no one ever said, thanks, Dad, for building the fire up. Okay? I'd wake, we don't know who the I is. What's the sex of the I? We don't know. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. How do you hear cold splintering or breaking? Well, it depends upon the kind of house you've lived in before, or apartment maybe. Again, if I use the analogy of that log cabin, if it was really cold and I built a hot fire, the living room where the wood stove was, the walls would crack and creak. Why? Basic physics. If I throw this in a freezer like this, if you can see where the level of the water is, what's that water going to do? It's going to freeze, right? And what's it going to do when it freezes? It's going to get larger, okay? Actually, probably more likely what's going to happen is this is going to bulge out, okay? When things get hot and cold, they expand and they contract. So those logs, when it gets really cold, it contracts. And then when it heats up, it gets larger. That's the creaking. That's what causes the creaking and cracking sound. That's the splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. So he doesn't wake anybody else up until the house is warm. And slowly I would rise and dress. Why slowly? Have any of you ever slept someplace where it's really cold? I don't mean like 55. That log cabin I lived in? January of 1985, I moved in in like December. January of 1985, the Eastern United States had a massive cold spill. I mean, it's like coldest in 100 years. I lived on the top of Lookout Mountain in this little cabin. Cabin's built for the summer. And Lookout Mountain didn't get above zero for three days. That log cabin, the toilet froze solid, both in the tank and in the bowl, below 32 degrees, therefore, stayed solid for longer than three days, okay? What do you do, imagine yourself in that kind of situation, and you know you have to get up in the morning. Do you get up and just ready to attack? No, because... What are you when you're in your blankets and asleep? You're warm, you're cozy, and then you've got to get up to the cold. And even though the father has built the fire and made it warmer, it's not as warm as it is under those blankets. That's one reason. Slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Who's fearing the chronic angers of the house? The speaker. 
that fearing the chronic angers of that house, that modifies the I. Okay? And notice there's a pause, but not an end of the sentence. Speaking indifferently to him. Who's doing the speaking indifferently to him? Is that the I, the speaker? Or does that refer to the chronic angers of that house? Who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. We'll stop there and we'll look at this last stanza. Just read the assigned pages um, for the reading poetry section. And then those two poems that I mentioned, author to her book in A Valediction Forbidding Morning. Read those for Friday. <laughs>